Welcome to this screencast on how to configure your Java Server Faces web application for security using a MySQL database. To get your system up and running as quickly as possible, there are several tasks that have to be completed in order. Here are the first four. And here are the final four. This doesn't include testing your application, so actually that would be a ninth. There are many ways to <clears throat> create the database tables that you're going to need to do secure access to your web application. Basically you're going to have to have some user accounts and you're going to have to have some group membership um, uh, information. Um, but there are many different ways to do this and a lot of the information on the internet either is misleading or dead wrong. So I can't cover the hundreds of different ways of doing this but I can show you one way that works very well and gives you a lot of flexibility. Now I'm using uh, MySQL, um, I think it's version 5.5. Some of you might be using the newer version and your workbench may look different than mine. However, um, the basic concepts are going to be the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to view our, dat our existing databases. Here are mine. Yours are obviously going to be different. And what we're going to do is I'm going to give you an SQL script that's going to create <clears throat> a sample database just for the demo program. And this database will be called JDBC Realm. You can see I've already created it. So to load the script to create this database, you're going to find an icon or a menu selection to open an SQL script. And then you're going to navigate to the demo project which is called JSF Secure, and in the source directory under main SQL, you'll find the script. Open that up and take a look at what it's going to do. It's going to create a data database called JDBC Realm. It's going to use that database to create tables. It's going to create a table called Users. It's going to create another table called Groups. And within each of those tables, the users table will have a username and password. Notice that the username is a varchar uh, of up to 255 characters. It is required, so it's not null. It is also going to be the primary key. And then there's a password field, also a varchar of 255 characters. And that's very important because we're not going to store our passwords uh, as um, simple plain text passwords. We're going to encrypt them and we'll need all of those characters for the encryption. We won't encrypt them immediately, however, and you'll see how that f unfolds in a moment. Now the groups table is, these are the roles that these users can play, and this particular version has a username, which matches up with the username in the users table, and a group name, which associates a particular user with a particular group. Now there are other ways of doing this that are more efficient. We're going to, with doing it this way, we're going to have some duplication. In other words, let's say that we have a group called admin, um, or, or for example, here's a group called user. Let's say here's Sally who's in the user group and Tom who's also in the user group. So you're going to repeat um, in this groups table, you're going to have one entry for each user and you'll be repeating group names in some cases like we did with user. But that's okay because it doesn't take up a lot of space and this is really the easiest way to do it. Now I don't recommend that you modify the group table at all. However, the users table, if you want to store additional information about your users, let's say you want to store address, phone number, whatever, you can add those fields. Just don't modify these existing fields. Also, I strongly recommend that your username be an email address. 
rather than creating a separate email field. The reason for this is that um, email addresses are, all, are almost always unique values and are great. They serve a dual purpose if you use them as a username because not only do you have a username, but you have an email address that you can use to send them information. On the other hand, if you prefer the traditional username concept and a separate email field, you're free to do that as well. Okay, so we're going to create these two tables and then we're going to insert some sample accounts. So we've got Bob, who is an administrator. We've got Sally and Tom, who are users. And temporarily, we're just going to use password 1, password 2, and password 3. Those will be changed later, and you'll see how that works. So this script is going to create everything you need to, to use um, the sample program. Um, and you can use similar concepts within your own database. So to run this script, find the icon um, to execute the script. I'm not going to execute it because I've already done that. And that will create your database. Okay, now that we have the database tables created and the sample accounts entered in, we're going to need to replace the clear text passwords that were provided. We, remember we had password 1, password 2, and password 3. We're going to need to um, replace those with hashed versions. Now, the, there's, a, there's a utility class that I've provided. It's called hash password generator. And if you open that up, this code will generate the hash versions for these three passwords. Now the reason we need to do this is that this is a form hashing is a form of encryption. It's specifically a one way, it's called a one way hash, and that means that the passwords are encrypted, but they cannot be decrypted. That's why it's called a one way hash. So it's a very good form of security. And the reason we need to store passwords in encrypted form is so that um, any sensitive data stored in the database is not available to um, anyone who might have um, mischievous ideas in mind. For example, you could have a disgruntled employee that's a system administrator that might have access to the database and they could steal sensitive information. So um, encrypting passwords and other sensitive information is just a good uh, basic uh, thing, uh, best practice for managing web apps. So um, we're going to um, use this sample code to call this method. We pass in a password and it returns um, a hashed version and then we're just going to output that to the console. Here I'm creating three at a time. You could you could change this and you know create one at a time or whatever you want to do. Um, but we're going to go ahead and run this. So I'm just going to say run file. And in a few seconds you'll see the hashed versions of the passwords. And here they are. Here, are the, here they are in order. Now we're going to copy each of these individually. So just copy the first one. That's password 1. And we're going to go to our database. We're going to go to the user table in our JDBC Realm. And we're going to edit the user table. And we're going to, now I've already done it, but you're going to highlight the clear text password and paste in the hashed version. And after you've done that, you'll hit this um, Apply Changes. So after you've replaced all three, you'll hit Apply Changes. Um, I don't have any changes, um, but you will. And then you'll have stored the hashed versions. So you can see why we needed 255 characters. These things get very, very long. OK, that's mandatory, so please be sure you do this exactly as described. Okay, the next thing we need to do is we need to do something called configuring the JDBC realm. And a realm is a security term that indicates that the server has to be configured to support um, handling security for us. So here's how we're going to do that. 
We're going to switch to the Services tab in NetBeans. We're going to find our GlassFish server and we're going to do a start. Now I've already started mine, so to save time um, I've already pre-started it. Once the server is running, you can tell by this little green chevron icon, once it's running, go to right-click on it and go to View Domain Admin Console. This will bring up in your web browser, it'll bring up the administrative screen for the server. And here's our main screen. Now what I want you to do is I want you to go over to this navigation area and I want you to find under configurations server config and under server config I want you to go to the security section and under security I want you to go to realms and under and when you click on realms you'll see at this screen here now I've already created a JDBC realm you're gonna to need to create yours by clicking this new button now when you click that, you're going to get the following dialog box, which I've already filled in. And you're going to type in the name of the realm as, and use the same uh, terminology I'm using, J all lowercase JDBC hyphen realm. Okay, so enter that in for the name. And then you're going to set this jazz context exactly as you see it here lowercase jdbc and then realm. You're going to set the Jindy name exactly as you see it here. Exactly. Then you're going to identify your user table. This is the schema name and this is the actual table name. Then you're going to identify the user column, the username column, the password column, the group table, the group table username column, and the group table uh, the group name column. You then must enter AES for the encryption algorithm. We will be also using the default value for digest algorithm which is SHA-256. So we're not going to fill anything in here because that's the default. Um, MD5 is an older system that's not as secure so SHA is the better choice. We can skip the rest of these fields um, however, we are going to use UTF-8 for the character set, and that's all there is to this configuration. So be sure you double-check all of these entries and get them exactly as I show you here. Again, I'll give you a chance to take notes or whatever you have to do or do a screen dump. Okay, so there's all of the settings. Then click the save button. Now I'm going to click cancel because I, I haven't changed anything. Okay, now once you've saved your changes you can exit this screen and you will have to stop your server because those changes won't take effect until the server is restarted. So that's how you set up the JDBC realm. Okay, now that we have our JDBC Realm created, let's go ahead and create a Maven web project. Now, I've shown you how to do this in the past, but I'm going to go through it again in detail, and, and this time we'll cover a lot more ground than we have in the past. So this will be a great reference for just generally creating Maven projects. All right, let's create a new project. It'll be a Maven web application and for this demo I'm not gonna bother with the name I'm just gonna go with the defaults and I'll do the same thing for the group ID version and package but you should really use appropriate group ID and package names that um, make sense for your application okay so here we go next we're gonna make sure that we're using glassfish 4 and JEE 7 and finish. And in just a few moments we'll have our project. There's our project and you'll note that um, we have a palm which controls the libraries that are used and we have 
um, initially just a plain HTML file and no source packages at all. What we're going to do first is we're going to make sure that our project is configured to use Java server faces. Now, if you were not using Glassfish as an application server, you would need to modify the palm and you would need to add the JSF libraries as dependencies. So you would have to add a new dependency for Java server faces. But we're using Glassfish, so we don't need to add those libraries because they're already built in. So all we have to do is tell our, pro is tell, um, our project that we want to use JSF. So we're going to right click on the project. We're going to go to Properties. And then we're going to select Frameworks and click Add. I'm going to pick Java Server Faces, and then very important, wait, wait for this to appear, for JSF 2.2 to appear as a server library, and wait for the registered libraries to appear in grayed out text right here. Make sure you wait long enough for the, for all of that to set before you hit OK. And then in a few moments, you'll notice that now you have an XHTML file. That's our JSF homepage, and we no longer need the plain HTML, so I'm just going to go ahead and delete that. Okay, so we have our plain, uh, our, our JSF uh, file. There's our homepage. Um, and that's it. That's all, that's all it's really done for us. Now, the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to... Um, We're going to want to add any libraries uh, that are additional libraries that are necessary in our palm. So we're going to open up the palm and we're going to look for the dependency area. And the first dependency that I'm going to add is uh, for a library called Google Guava. Google Guava is a, um, let's take a look. Google Guava is a utility library that um, Google makes available for free. And it has all kinds of utilities for doing things like text manipulation and a whole range of things. Um, we're going to need this for uh, some of the encryption that we're going to use for security. And I'll explain the details of that later. So for now, what I want you to do is, um, what we're going to do is, I've already, um, in my sample program, JSF Secure, I've already given you the dependency, and we're just going to copy and paste that. It's right here. We're just going to copy and paste that into our new project. There you have it. So there's the... Google Guava library. That's the um, that's one of the libraries we're, we're going to want to use. Um, I've shown you in previous videos how to add the Prime Faces libraries. I'm not going to duplicate that here. So for this um, security demo, all we really need is the Google Guava library. So th that's it. We're done with that. We can go ahead and save that, and we're ready to continue. Okay, the next thing we're going to want to do is um, consider the content in our website that needs to be secured. This folder that I'm highlighting, this web pages folder, that's the root directory for your web pages. And right now we just have one file, our home page, that is in that folder. Any, I, wanna, I want you to consider that anything in this folder uh, is public. In other words, you don't have to be logged in to view it. It's public content. But if you want secured content for different people in different roles, I recommend that you create separate directories for that. So, for example, I'm going to create a new folder. You go to Other. You go to Other and then find the folder. And we're going to create, I'm going to create a folder called Admin. And then I'm going to create another folder in the root called user. 
Now, you can create any folders you want, but as an example, I would use this folder for content that only logged in administrators can view. And I would use this folder for content that only logged in users could view. Now you may not want to call them users. You might want to call them members. It really doesn't matter. Call them whatever you want. For now, I'm going to use the term users. But you can create as many of these directories with as many terms as you want. Um, but the idea is that we segregate the content for these different groups of, user, of, of logged in users. So that way, we can, when we do our configuration, we can say, hey, anything in this folder you need to be an administrator to view. And anything in this folder, you need to be a user to view. But anything outside of those folders is public. You don't need to be logged in. So that's the easiest way to um, configure your, your project. Okay, the next thing we're going to need to do is add some optional configuration files. Now, when, you when we first created this Maven project, we got this webinf directory, and, and once we added the JSF capability, we got this webxml. Well, that's one configuration file that we need, because what that's used for right now is it's used for configuring the Java server faces servlet, and it's also used for our welcome page. Our, that's our home page. But we need some we're going to need some additional configuration files just in general, not not necessarily for security, but just in general, we need, we're going to need some additional ones. So let's go ahead and create them. Right-click on your project, New, Other, and the first thing we're going to do is going to go to Java Server Faces, and we're going to pick the Faces Configuration, and just accept the defaults, and you'll see that it adds this Faces Config. Now, initially, there's nothing in here. But in the future, we can use this for all kinds of things. The primary thing that we would use this for would be things like internationalization, which I've already demonstrated in a previous video. So right now, we're just not going to use that. But we want to have it available if we need it. The next one we're going to need, again, go to New Other, is we're going to need what's called a, gla a glassfish config descriptor. So go ahead and select that. Again, go with the defaults and you can see it has now added this glassfish web XML. This is going to be used for some of our security settings. So we're going to need that. And then one more. We're going to need one more and that will be again go to new other and under, I believe it is Glassfish again. No, under Context and Dependency Injection, add a Beans XML. And again, accept the defaults. And now you see you have your Beans XML. Um, this file is necessary for CDI, and CDI is the more is the new modern way of doing JSF. It also allows us to do more advanced dependency injection and some other things that I'm not going to cover in this video. So it's just good to have that for the future. And now we have all the config files under webinf, all the config files we need. Be very careful with this directory. You don't want to be accidentally putting your web pages in there. The only thing that should be in there are XML files. OK. Okay, the next thing I recommend you do is under other sources, um, we're going to want to add a directory to store our database backup files. Um, this is really a good idea because should you ever need to restore your database from a backup, um, it's nice to have them in your project and under source control by git so that you always have your 
database backups under git source control. So this folder is a special folder that um, really hides um, the real location. If you go, if you switch from the projects tab to the files tab, you'll see that under source, there's a main, and then under main, there are various directories. You don't see all this from the projects view. So, and you can't add directories using the right-click method here. But what we can do is right-click on the project and say new, other, go to folder under other, and then next. And now we're going to type in a folder name for our backup. So I'm just going to call this SQL as the folder name. I'm going to browse for the parent directory, and you want to pick main under source. And then it's going to add that SQL directory inside of the main directory. Click Finish. Now, you don't see it here, but you will see it here under main. Now, it will appear here if you close the project. I know this is kind of goofy, but you got to close your project and reopen it. And when I reopen it and go to other sources, now you'll see your SQL directory. And you can, right now this is empty, of course. You can paste anything you want into there. For example, in the demo project, JSF Secure, that I provided, you'll see that in the SQL directory, there's a SQL file. Let's pretend that this was one of your database backup files from MySQL. You can just copy the backup file and paste it in. And now you'll have your backup files in your project under Git source control. It's a great way of protecting yourself from failure because as we all know, we can lose things or we can screw things up and it's just a good idea to have these backups. So that's, a, that's just a good general idea. It, has, it isn't necessarily something you need for security, but it's just a good idea to do that. Okay, now we're gonna configure our application for database access using JPA. The first thing we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna to need to have a connection pool um, on the server that connects to our database for performance efficiency. Now normally to do that you would need to go into your server, you would need to start, up, start it up, and then you would need to go to the admin console and you would need to configure that um, on the server. Now, we could do that, but that means that whenever you move your app from one computer to another, you're going to have to do that all over again. A better way is to create a configuration file that we can use to automatically install that on the server, regardless of what computer you're on. So that's the technique we're going to use. So to do this, we have to have under services, under the services tab, we have to have our MySQL server connected. Now I've shown you how to have NetBeans connect to, your, to MySQL server uh, in the past, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, but what we, what we want to do is have a connection to one of our databases. Now the database we're going to connect to is the JDBC Realm database that I showed you how to um, create previously. So if I wanted to connect, have create a connection to this in NetBeans, I would simply right click and say connect. Now I've already done that and I've got my connection right here. I'm going to go ahead and enable it. You can see the icon is solid now instead of being broken and that means that we have a connection to that database and we can go in there and we can look at the tables and we can view data just like that 
and it's a beautiful thing. Okay, so once we have our connection established under the Services tab, uh, and you do want to connect to that JDBC Realm um, database for the security, then we're going to go back to Projects, and what we're going to do is we're going to right-click on our project, and we're going to go to Other, and we're going to go to Glassfish, and we're going to create a JDBC resource. Now, you're probably wondering, why resource? Why not connection pool? Well, you need a connection pool, and then you need a resource that connects to the connection pool. So by using this wizard, we'll get both, and you'll see that in a moment. So we're going to go ahead and click Next, and we're going to create a new JDBC connection pool. This is assuming you haven't done this already. And we would fill in the, um, we would create a, a custom Jindy name. You can call this whatever you want. Um, for now, I'm going to use um, test, but in the JSF secure demo, um, I used security data source. Okay, but I don't, I've already got that created. I want to. I don't want to create it again. So I'm going to go ahead and just say test for now. Again, you can use whatever you want. The it should be preceded by JDBC slash. This part you can have whatever you want. Um, again, in the JSF secure demo, I used security data source. Now we click next, and we can skip this screen. And now you need to give it a connection pool name. Now in the in the JSF secure demo, I use JDBC Realm Pool. Okay, for again, I've already got that, so I don't want to create it again. So I'm just going to say JDBC Test Pool, and then I select the connection in NetBeans that points to the database. So it's the JDBC Realm database, and we're creating a connection pool that connects to that. Okay, so then you click Next, and then you have to select the connection pool data source from the drop-down menu, and then you need to change this class name to the one for the connection pool data source. So we want to change this to look like that. MySQL connection pool data source. Be careful how you type it. Notice the upper and lower case letters. So take a good long look at that. You have to type that in manually. Okay, click next. You could modify some of these features. Um, this, this tells you how, how big your pool is. Um, if you had lots and lots of users connecting simultaneously, you'd want to up these values. But for now, we're just going to go with the defaults. Okay. Now we've created the connection pool and the JDBC resource. Now you don't see anything different. What I want you to do is I want you to close your project and reopen it. And now look under other sources and you'll see a setup folder. And in that setup folder, you're going to see Glassfish resources. And this XML file points to the pool name you just created, the Jindy name that you identified, and then it identifies the database connection and your username and password to connect to that. So what happens is this file is used when you run your project to create those the connection pool and the resource on the server um, if they don't already exist. If they already exist, it doesn't recreate it. So this way, no matter where you run your project, no matter what computer you run it on, it's automatically going to make sure that you have a connection pool 
um, configured and running on that server. It's a really nice way to work with connection pools using Glassfish. Okay, so we have a connection pool. Again, the reason we want to use that is for performance efficiency because connections are expensive to create. So this will make sure that we reuse existing connections uh, for performance benefits. All right, now, the next thing we're going to need to do is for JPA, we need a persistence unit that um, works with this connection pool. So we're going to right click on our project, new, other. We're going to go to persistence, and then we're going to create a persistence unit. So I'm going to click next. I want to create a persistent unit name, and I don't want to use this default. Um, this should describe, you know, your connection. Um, for example, if I, if for the demo I had JDBC, I think I had JDBC Realm persistence unit, but it can be anything you want. By convention, we we usually end it with capital PU, standing for persistence unit. We're using Eclipse. We could use other things like Hibernate, but Eclipse is the default. And then the data source is the one you created a little earlier. So in this case, I'm going to use test. For my JSF secure demo, I used the security data source. So we're going to, we're going to pick the one that we want to use. And then we want to make sure we use the Java transaction APIs, so that's important. We're not going to create any tables right now. We're just going to go with... That, typically, you would say none here. This is used if you have entity classes and you want the tables to be generated automatically from the entity classes. But we're just using an existing database that's got all the tables in it. So we're going to say, no, don't generate anything. We've already created the database. All right, click Finish. And in a few moments, you will have a new folder under Other Sources, Source Main Resources. You're going to have this meta inf and then persistence XML. And that's what this is. So this gives you a graphical view. We can also look at it as an XML file. And that's all we need to get to start using JPA. So we're going to close that. And let's review what we've done. This little guy here um, establishes our connection pool. And this guy um, uses our Jindy name to talk to that connection pool so that when we use JPA, it'll know which database to talk to. Okay. Okay, the next thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need a login page. Now, we're also going to need an, an error page that displays any login problems. Now, I've already provided you with some samples of these. So I'm going to I'm going to steal the samples. Um, here they are, login and login error. I'm going to just copy those from the sample that I gave you. And I'm going to paste them in to my web pages folder in my in this in this project. And so there they are. And let's take a look at each one. First the, the login page. And I've got some descriptive information here that you should read. But the basic idea here is that we're using um, a combination of um, JSF tags and plain HTML tags. Normally, and I've told you this before, we want to avoid the plain HTML versions. We want to use the JSF versions. And that's true in almost all situations. However, for this security system, we have to go back to using some plain HTML. And the reason for that is not that it's absolutely mandatory. It's just that this is going to be the easiest way to get a login page working. I could create a login page with all JSF tags, but then I wouldn't be able to, then I would have to write some server-side code to process the login. And I don't want to do that. I want to take advantage of the built-in capabilities of Glassfish. So, we're going to use a normal HTML form tag, and the advantage of this is going to be 
that we can set the action property to point to J underscore security check. It's got to be spelled exactly like that. What that is, is that's the name of a hidden built-in servlet that is in Glassfish. And what that means is we don't have to write any code to process the login. But this doesn't work from a JSF form tag. So this only works from an HTML form tag. So that's why we're using that. Now I can still use some JSF tags. I'm using a panel grid for, for layout purposes. I'm using an output label um, for a prompt. And, but then I'm using a normal HTML input. And again, I have to do that if I want to use this built-in servlet. That has to have a name equal to J underscore username. That, that has to be spelled exactly like that. And that um, is where the username is entered. And then we're going to have a password field as well. It's got to be J underscore password. And then we need a normal submit button um, with type equal to submit. And you can have whatever value here you want. Um, but this, again, if you were to use the, the um, Java server faces version, it would not, you know, like say a command button here, it would not go to this servlet. And, and so, you know, then we'd have to write our own server side code. But by using this normal HTML input for a submit button, then it'll go to this servlet. So that's why we're using a mixture of HTML and JSF. And, uh, and that's that's it for the login page. You can you can um, you know you can lay this out any way you want. You can use cascading style sheets. You know you can get creative uh, with how this looks. But for now, um, this will be our demo for that. So there's the login page. Now we're also going to need a an error page, and the the error page is what is we're going to configure later. Is going to um, be the page you see when um, somebody's login fails. And so what I've got here is a headline styled in red that says, sorry, access denied. And then there's a paragraph that says your credentials could not be verified or you are not authorized to view the content. And then it, take, it gives you a link back to the home page. Um, again, you don't, you know, you can, you can say whatever you want here. You can do whatever you want on this page, but you, you should have an error page that um, uh, people will go to when their login fails for some reason. So there's the error page. Now, the next thing we have to do is configure this uh, to be used. So here's what, how you do that. You go to this web inf directory and you open up the web XML file. And then we're going to go over to the security button. Okay. Now, under login configuration, we want to set the type to form, okay? And we're going to identify the login page by browsing for it, and we're going to select our login page. Now, unfortunately, this GUI interface isn't smart enough to do what it should be doing. And what it should be doing is saying faces slash login. Because this is a Java server faces page and it will not be processed correctly if we don't pre uh, precede it with the term faces. And why is that? Well, if you go back to the source view, we can see that our Java server faces facelet, our Java server faces servlet expects all Java server faces pages to be preceded by the word faces. That's why. So if we don't precede it with faces, it won't be interpreted as a Java server faces page and it won't work correctly. Now we need to do the same thing for the error page. And again, precede it with faces. Okay, so we have our Login page, we have our error page identified, and now we need to identify the JDBC Realm name that we created earlier. So that's JDBC hyphen Realm. Okay. All right. 
That's the login configuration. Let's go ahead and save our changes. We can close that up. The next thing we need to do is have some security roles. These are the roles or groups that our users are going to belong to. So we're going to click Add. And we're going to say, well, I've got a role name admin. Now, the name can be anything you want it to be. But I'm going to recommend that your names of your roles match up with the names of your folders in your web app. So I've got an admin folder for administrators, a users folder for users, and I want and those should match your role name. They don't have to, but it makes it easier to keep things straight in your mind if you use the same terminology. So let's go back to over here, create one more role. This will be our users role. And again, we now we have two roles, admin and users that match up with our folders. All right. Now, we need some security constraints. So we'll click on this button, and we're going to just name these appropriately. We're going to have one con security constraint for admin role and one for users role. So I'm just going to give this the name admin constraint, and we're going to click this Add button under Web Resource Collection. And we're going to say that um, this is the admin uh, constraint or resource. And what we're going to say is that any folder, any um, code in the What I'm going to say is that anything that goes to faces admin folder and anything inside of it, so that star means any file, any page inside this folder, and again we have to precede it with faces because that means that we're treating all this content as Java server faces pages. So what we're saying is that we want to secure the content in the admin directory to be only available to people with the role admin. I don't recommend you select all HTTP methods. I recommend you only select get and post. I've had problems when all of these are selected. I've had problems getting the security to work. So I recommend just get and post. You don't really need these other ones anyway. OK, so let's click OK. We now have an admin constraint that says, hey, um, if, you're in, if, if a page is in the admin directory, you, mu you must be an administrator. Now, we also need to enable this constraint and tell it which roles are allowed to access that content. So we say, oh, only administrators. OK, so those are the roles that are allowed to view the content in, in this directory. And then one more thing we have to do is we have to enable a user data constraint. And we have to set the transport guarantee to confidential. What that does is it enables SSL, Secure Socket Layer, which is the thing that encrypts all of our data flow between client and server. OK, so there's our admin constraint. Now let's do a user constraint. So for our users, we're going to add users, URL pattern is faces slash users, that's our directory. Anything in that directory is going to be treated securely. And then we need to enable the authentication constraint. And we want to enable both administrators and users to view that content. So the idea here is that for the administrator constraint, only the administrators can view that content. But for the user constraint, both administrators and users 
can view this content. Okay? And then again, we want to enable, because otherwise, if you didn't do that, uh, administrators would be locked out. We don't want that. That's what an administ administrator should be able to see everything. And then we need to enable the constraint, the um, transport guarantee to confidential. Okay. That concludes that portion of security setup. Now, again, if you had more roles than just these two, then you would have additional constraints. You can have as many roles as you want. All right. Okay, we're almost done. One more configuration to complete the security setup. We're going to double click on under web inf, under web pages. We're going to go to the Glassfish web XML. And we're going to go over to the security button. And you're going to notice that you already have a entry for admin and for users that matches up with what we did earlier. But we need to configure these. We need to map these names to the groups that you have in your database. Now these names don't necessarily have to match, but if you use the sample database that I had you generate earlier, I'll give you a, a quick look at that, where we had an admin group and a user group. Notice user singular, not plural. I did that on purpose because I want to show you that this security role may match the group name. In this case, it does. Okay. But for users, the role name does not match the group in the database. The group name in the database is user. And I did that on purpose. just to show you that the name for the role does not have to manage, match the name in your database for the group. Okay, so that concludes our security configuration. Um, this Glassfish Web XML, if you look at it as source code, you can see how, the, how those role mappings were added. And then the same thing for the web XML. We were looking at it graphically. We can look at it as source code. And you can see it's added a lot of stuff here um, for the um, configuration of security. So once again, you can see why web XML is a pretty important file. That concludes the setup of the Maven project. Let's review what we've accomplished. Uh, we've added to the Palm uh, a custom library for Guava. And you'll see how that's used in a little bit. So we've added this. Now if we wanted to use Prime Faces, we would add the Prime Faces dependencies as well. And I've shown you how to do that in a previous video. We've um, set up our project for JSF by going to Properties, Frameworks, and we added the Java Server Faces libraries. We added some additional configuration files, two of which we're not doing much with right now, uh, and the other two were used for security configuration. We've also added directories that will house, right now there's nothing in them, but they will house content that is exclusive to those users. And, they'll ha and to access that content, you have to log in. The other content is, does not require a login. And then we added a directory for our, SQ our database backups. We also um, generated a Glassfish Resources XML. And that was done to get a connection pool. And we also generated our persistence XML for JPA. So this, this is the connection pool. This is enables JPA. So we've got JPA, we've got JSF configured, we've got security configured. We are done. 
and obviously we'd have to create some content, but I've already done that. And so I'm going to switch over to um, my demo project, JSF Secure, which is already set up with some content. So let's take a look at the content. Under web pages, I have the home page, the login page, and the login error page. Now on the home page, what I did was I put a whole bunch of instructional material in here. We'll look at that in a moment. Um, I also have a JSF form with a command link pointing to a logout function. And that's necessary because you want to give people a way to log out so that you don't leave your computer in a state where somebody can, you know, let's say you go grab a cup of coffee and uh, you're logged in and somebody comes up behind you, you know, somebody comes up to your machine and it's unlocked and, and they can use your credentials to do whatever they want. So you should always log out when you're, when you're not, you know, when you're not by your machine. So unfortunately, you have to write your own code to do that. So what I gave you was a logout theme that is programmed to automatically log you out. And to do that, what we do is um, we set up a destination. This is where you're redirected when you log out, and this is going to take you to the home page. Um, you need this faces redirect. You need this to actually redirect to that page. Then you use this technique to get access to the request object. So the faces context gives you a way to get the request object which is an, a, a, a servlet request object. And then that is what we use to actually log out. And then you just go to the destination. So this logout bean is what is used by this guy to log you out. Then I've got the login page, which I've already shown you, and the home page, which I just showed you, and the error page. We talked about that earlier. Now, in these directories, I have just home pages for each of those. So um, it isn't necessary that you use the word index, but index is the is the default for a home page name. And so each of these directories has its own home page. And uh, basically, what I do here is I display a message that lets you know you're on the user's page. I give you a way to go back home, and I give you a way to log out on both of these. So there's nothing fancy going on here. Keep in mind, though, that all the content in these directories requires that you be logged in with the appropriate role. Here you have to be logged in as an administrator. Here you have to be logged in as either an administrator or a user. And we'll see that in a moment. So there you have it. Very simple. Um, what, what is, what's not in here, which you should probably consider adding, is a directory for resources because that's what JSF uses for things like CSS. And so in other words, what, what I'm talking about is go ahead and create a new folder, uh, resources, and in that folder is where you store things like, I'm going to have images, oops. I have images, oops, images. I'm probably going to want cascading style sheets. So I have a folder for that. And one more for if I have any JavaScript. I'll just call that JS. So typically, you're going to, you're going to you know, if you're going to use CSS, images, and JavaScript or any combination, you want to store, create folders inside of a resources directory because that's what JSF uses when you use the JSF tags to access these things. And I've demonstrated this in the previous videos. Okay, so let's, let's run the program. So this is the demo program that I gave you. It's all pre-configured. Let's go ahead and run it. Oops. Run. And I'm going to pause the recording until it starts up. And here's our web application. So first of all, 
This describes some of the security concepts. Authentication is when you log in, your credentials are checked against the database. Authorization is what groups do you belong to. And encryption uh, is how we make sure that hackers can't see our content. We also want to encrypt data in a database, which I'm going to show you shortly. But let's go ahead and run this and show you how it works. So for the demo, I've got um, three accounts. I've got Bob, who's an administrator with, with the password, password1. I've got Sally and Tom, who are users, and they have passwords uh, as well. So let's, go, let's try um, first um, logging in as Sally. So I'm going to go to the user section. And because the user section, and what we're talking about by user section is this folder here, any content in there. So this link points to the home page in that folder. So if I click on this, it's going to recognize that I'm not logged in. It's war it's, by the way, it's warning me that um, SSL, the encryption mechanism, is based on the concept of a certificate. We're using a developer certificate that's built into GlassFish, and because it isn't certified, it's not trusted. And that's fine. For development, we don't need a trusted certificate. But in a production environment, you would want to purchase a trusted certificate from someone like VeriSign or Thought, and you pay good money, anywhere from a couple hundred bucks on up, um, which is why we don't want to bother for a developer account. So we're just going to say, okay, I understand. Proceed anyway. And you'll notice it takes us immediately to the login page because it knows that we're not um, able to access that content un unless we're logged in. Now, if I go back to the home page, I can view the home page without logging in because remember, anything outside of these two directories, users and admin, is public content. So we don't need to be logged in to view that content. It's only when we go to one of these directories that we have to be logged in. And so the only time the login form appears is when you go to a section that's secured. So there we are. Now I'm going to type in Sally's name, uh, username, Sally, and her password, P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D-2. And I click login. And you'll notice that I successfully get to the users page. Because I'm authenticated as Sally, it found a match, and I'm authorized to view this to view this content. But if we go back to the home page, and tr now remember, I'm logged in as Sally. If we go back to the home page and try to go to the admin section and go to the admin section, you see that it says, "Sorry, access denied. Your credentials could not be verified, or you are not authorized to view the content you desire." She can't view the admin content, but she can view the user content. So that's basically how this works. Now, to make that possible, you have to have in your WebXML, you have to have an you have to have your error pages set to point to error code 403. Make sure it's 403 and not 404, and make sure your error page is preceded by faces. If you have to go into source code to make that modification, then do so. Okay, right here. All right, so that concludes the JSF security demo.